So now that we talked about just some general basics of cell communication and signaling, let's get into the details. So cell signaling consists of three major stages. Um, the first is reception. That's when the signaling molecule binds to uh, something called a receptor. After that is a signal transduction pathway. These are the intermediate steps that I referred to before. And then finally, this leads to some type of cellular response. So we're now going to go into more detail on each of these three major stages. So during reception, a signaling molecule called a ligand binds to a protein that's called a receptor. Now the shape of the receptor has to be very specific to the shape of the ligand. So like in this picture, you can see that there's both circular and triangle signaling molecules floating around outside of the cell, but only the triangle is able to fit into the receptor. So we refer to this as a lock and key analogy. So just like only a specific key can open a certain lock, only a very specific ligand can bind to a certain receptor. Now, how that signaling molecule or ligand is actually perceived by the cell depends on what type of molecule it is. So ligands that are polar molecules have to bind to membrane-bound receptors. So here, this shows a membrane-bound receptor. On the other hand, Nonpolar ligands, such as hormones that are steroids, like testosterone and estrogen, they're actually able to go directly through the plasma membrane and bind to receptors that are intracellular or inside the cell. So I'd like you now to take a moment to think about why there is this difference. Why is it that a polar ligand cannot enter the cell and has to bind to a membrane-bound receptor, and why a nonpolar ligand is able to go through the plasma membrane. So I'd like you to write down that answer and we'll discuss it in class. Okay, so what happens next after the ligand binds the receptor? So we have something referred to as the signal transduction pathway. During this pathway, a signal is relayed from the receptor to various signaling molecules and finally to a particular target molecule. So this fairly complex picture shows just a sampling of the signal transduction pathways that exist in an animal cell. So let's say we focus on this particular receptor and says here that growth factors bind to this receptor and then when they bind to the receptor that leads to the activation of this molecule and then this molecule and then this and this and this and this and this and this and this. It's pretty long. You could think of these signal transduction pathways kind of like dominoes falling. So one domino knocks over the next, the next, the next, and next. Now you might think, what's the point of this? Why can't we just knock over one molecule and be done with it? Well, rather than this single row of dominoes, these single transduction pathways are more like um, a setup of dominoes like this, where one domino will knock down three, which will then knock down more dominoes and more and more until you have a very large group that have all been knocked down. So the purpose of the signal transduction pathway is that it greatly amplifies the initial signal. Rather than the final molecule that's being activated being a single molecule, we can have thousands, if not millions, of activated molecules at the end. So I'd like to give you an example of this signal amplification in a specific signaling pathway. So if we go back to our angry hippo example, seeing that angry hippo will cause your adrenal glands to produce this epinephrine hormone, which will then go through, through a signal transduction pathway, signal your liver and muscle cells to produce an enzyme that breaks down glycogen into glucose molecules. So what's interesting is that the binding of a single molecule of epinephrine to its receptor can eventually lead to the activation of 100 million enzyme molecules. That's some serious amplification. 
So now we'll go into some details of how the signal transduction happens. How is the message relayed from the receptor through this long line of signal molecules? One of the early steps in many, though not all, signal transduction pathways is the production of second messengers. Second messengers are small molecules that relay signals from membrane-bound receptors to the signal transduction cascade. So in this example, it shows you a ligand binding to a receptor, and when the ligand binds to the receptor, it leads to the activation of an enzyme through some intermediary steps that I'm not going to go into. And this activated enzyme then produces a second messenger called cyclic AMP, or CAMP for short. Now, the a purpose of producing these second messengers is that they are very small, so they can easily spread through the cell by diffusion and then activate other signaling molecules. So when the ligand binds, there's an activation of an enzyme that produces many, many, many small second messenger molecules that can quickly spread throughout the cytoplasm of the cell and then activate many, many other uh, molecules that are further down in the signal transduction pathway. And I just wanted to show you some examples of second messengers that are very common in many signal transduction pathways. So cyclic AMP is very common, as well as calcium ions. So after the cell has produced the second messenger, how does the second messenger then relay the signal to the rest of the pathway, and how is that signal passed on? Well, one very common way of relaying a signal is by changing the conformation or shape of a protein. So in this simple diagram shows you an inactive protein that has this particular shape, and as its shape changes, it now becomes active. Now one method, not the only method, but one method of changing the shape of a protein and activating it is through something called protein phosphorylation. So phosphorylation is when a phosphate group is attached to a protein and then the addition of that phosphate causes the protein to change shape and now become active. A group of molecules that can do this are protein kinases. Kinases can take the phosphate from ATP and then attach it to other proteins. So here in this um, specific example of a signal transduction pathway, it shows you how an initial signal, such as DNA damage, can lead to the activation of a protein by attaching a phosphate which then attaches a phosphate to another protein and another protein and so on. These proteins that are part of this signal transduction pathway are all actually kinases. So one kinase becomes activated, that kinase then activates another kinase and another kinase. And we refer to this as a phosphorylation cascade. Now, in addition to these kinases, we also have molecules called protein phosphatases. Phosphatases are enzymes that have the ability to remove a phosphate from a protein. So what they will do is this phosphatase will remove this phosphate, causing that protein to go back to its inactive form. So one question I would like you to, to think about is, what is the purpose of these phosphatases? What would happen if all the cell had were these kinases and the protein phosphatases were broken, not working? How would that affect the signal transduction pathway? Write the answer down and we'll discuss it in class. So let's review what we've discussed so far. So we've talked about the three main stages of cell signaling. First, we have reception, where a ligand binds to a receptor and their shapes have to match exactly. The binding of the ligand to the receptor then leads to the activation of a signal transduction pathway. These signal transduction pathways have many forms, but one common, though not the only one, 
is that there is first a production of, a sec of second messenger molecules, which then activate a kinase, which then activates another kinase and another, so on in a phosphorylation cascade. And then finally, we have the cellular response. So in the cellular response, the final activated protein could be an enzyme, which has the job of catalyzing a chemical reaction that then leads to changes in the metabolism of the cell. Or the final activated protein could be a transcription factor. You will learn more about these later. But so far, I'll just tell you that these transcription factors have the ability to either activate or inhibit gene transcription, which leads to changes in gene expression of the cell. But lastly, that final activated protein could be a cytoskeletal protein, which has the job of rearranging the cytoskeleton of the cell, which then leads to changes in either cell shape or cell movement. Okay, so since cell signaling can be fairly complicated, I just wanna go through the major concepts again using our angry hippo example. So imagine you suddenly come face to face with this angry hippo. Your brain will then signal your adrenal glands to release the hormone epinephrine, which is delivered using the bloodstream to muscle and liver cells. And this is an example of long distance communication between cells. When epinephrine reaches the target cells, it binds to a specific receptor. Binding of the ligand to the receptor leads to the activation of an enzyme that then produces a second messenger called cyclic AMP in this particular case. Then cyclic AMP will cause the activation of a kinase, which in this cell signaling pathway is one that's referred to as protein kinase A or PKA. PKA then activates another kinase, and we have a phosphorylation of cascade of one kinase activating another, activating another. And then that leads to a final cellular response, which is the activation of the enzyme called glycogen phosphorylase, which catalyzes a reaction of breaking down glycogen into individual glucose monomers, which can then enter your bloodstream and go to many of your muscle cells to provide them with a source of energy for cellular respiration so that you can run. So we have, again, initial binding of a ligand to the receptor, production of cyclic AMP, a signal transduction cascade involving phosphorylation of kinases, and then the final cellular response is the activation of an enzyme which catalyzes a specific chemical reaction that the cells need. So now that we discussed an example of a sig cell signal transduction pathway, let's have a review question. Why are there so many steps in the cell signaling pathway? Why can't the activated receptor just simply lead to the final cellular response? So think about it, write your answer down, and we'll discuss it in class. I also wanted to show you how in some cases the same ligand can lead to different cellular responses depending on which cell um, it binds to. So here's an example of acetylcholine signaling. So when this signal molecule binds to a receptor in a heart pacemaker cell, it causes it to slow down heart contraction. So you can rest. Also, um, when it, it can bind to salivary gland cells, and in that case, the final response is the release of saliva. Acetylcholine can also bind to your skeletal muscle cells, and their response is activation of muscle contraction. So we have three different cell types, all binding the same ligand and all responding to it differently. Now, one thing I'd like you to notice that in the heart pacemaker and the salivary gland cell, acetylcholine is binding to the same receptor. It has the same shape, but there is a different response. So same receptor, different response. 
And that's due to the, the fact that the receptor activates a different signal transduction pathway inside the cell. Now, in the skeletal muscle cell, it actually binds to a different receptor and then leads to the different response. Now, we talked about how the shape of the ligand has to fit the receptor exactly. So how is it possible that it can bind to a different receptor? Well, the little groove that's available in the receptor over here in this skeletal muscle cell is actually the same shape as the groove that's over here. So the receptor is different, but the actual binding between the ligand and the receptor, the actual interaction between these two molecules is the same. But the takeaway message I'd like you to take to remember from this is that the ligand binding to the receptor is specific, but depending on what kind of cell signaling pathway that receptor is hooked up to, you can have a different response. So throughout this presentation, I've been focusing on signal transduction pathways that deal with polar ligands that bind to membrane-bound receptors. However, I did mention at the beginning that some signaling molecules are nonpolar, and they are perceived by the cell differently. So to remind you, a nonpolar ligand, such as a steroid hormone like testosterone or estrogen, can enter the cell directly um, by going through the plasma membrane, and there it binds to a receptor. And when they bind, that forms an activated hormone receptor complex that can, in this case, then enter the nucleus, and it acts like a transcription factor. It binds to DNA and activates the transcription of a particular gene. So from this example, you can also see that some cell signaling pathways can be very simple, not as complex as um, the others we talked about. I also want you to remember that a specific hormone can regulate different sets of genes in different cell types. So depending on which target cell the hormone goes into will determine which genes are actually activated. So that's the end of the presentation, and I just want to leave you with one final thought. Each of your cells has about 21,000 protein coding genes. And of those 21,000 genes, more than 7,000 are dedicated to functioning in cell signaling pathways. That's a pretty big percentage. That should show you that cell signaling is a major part of what your cells do. Most, many of their genes are dedicated to carrying out signals so that cells can communicate.